Okay, this theater was bought in 1975 from the proceeds from a sex show. <laughs> okay, talk about breaking rules. Basically, uh, equity, well, well, we'll wait for equity for a moment. Uh, this is Baby Blue, I love you Baby Blue. I love you Baby Blue, yeah. Uh, we got kicked out of the space there and it was scheduled to be torn down. They had the most effective way of kicking us out. They supplied the heat to the building, so they just turned off the heat. <laughs> so here we are in a semi-cold room. I feel very close to that moment there where we tried to tough it out and had noisy fans. We could turn the noisy fan on so you could share that experience. But uh, we had noisy fans and realized you couldn't put those on during a show. So our protest was not going to last for very long. And we had a lot of talent hanging around and, and, and we even had an audience that was curious about the next show. And so we ended up in that season probably playing, well we had seed shows and main stage shows, so I think we were doing about 20, 20, between 20 and 25 a year. And that was the year Codco uh, got started over on Passamorai East. This is the year when Ted Johns did his first one-man show. This is the year when John Palmer did an impossible show that was a, one of the biggest turkeys we ever did, written by Rick Salutin, called The False Messiah. Oh, right. Uh, right. This is a huge right. year. We're, right. you know, we're full of ourselves because we've had a couple hits, and, and I think there's even a little bit of uh, increase in the Arts Council grants about that time. Right. And we want to take on the whole city, so we play in about 10 different spots in this city, and we're doing this play about like Toronto discovered sex in about 1974 and um, we wanted to do a play about it and we're looking around for a place to put it on and the only place we can put it on Bathurst Street United Church a gift <laughs> normally we're used to playing in 150 seats it's got 600 the seat, the, because it's in the church because it's racy because this is the, the church actors at Bloor and Bathurst, Bloor and Bathurst right. yeah and because because of all of these elements uh, falling, the alignment falls in, and a wonderfully talented group of actors, particularly the women who just took charge of the play and knew why they were doing whatever they were doing in it. Uh, it was a hit. It played for 13 weeks. The actors who, by equity rules, were supposed to get somewhere between 70 and $75 a week were by the Passamorai scramble rules, which was share in the, in the, the wealth, on, I think on their best week they were making 270 or 75 dollars. Mm. Yeah, so I, and including myself, I, I just put myself on equal with the actors. So then they turned the heat and, off. And no, 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 no. At that time we were out of the building, the heat was off, and they, you know, we were all saying, "Well, this is great for this show, but it, we still need a place." Right. And um, and I said, "Yeah, we do. That's interesting. I'm glad you believe that." So after drinking a bit across the road from the theater up there every night, um, I sort of said, "Well, why don't we each?" just give 1% of our earnings back into the theater, just like that. And at the end of the run we had $30,000 and we went out and after a lot of complications bought this building, which was run down. Uh, it was, it was, was a bakery, right? It was formerly a bakery. It went through endless things. There's even a hint, but I haven't found any historical verification for this, that it was the Italian consulate at some point or another. But that can't exactly where, where the horses why. were? This is, this the, is the part where the horses were. If stables. You go, yeah, the stables. Uh, actually, the upstairs would have been for the straw. Right. And you can, when you go outside the, uh, the framing for this, you'll be able to see. Um, there's a place where you could hoist the straw up to the second level and keep it there. There are windows right along here for, you know, six or eight, maybe even ten horses that would look out and presumably that was before the building was next door so they might have had a better view of an early Toronto landscape. I think the building was somewhere around 1902. There's a, a kind of a little hook on the... In fact, the reason we had this building was a, a, a visual artist called Charlie Pactor who had a flair for buildings, still has. Uh, had bought this building next door and knew we were looking for space and said, take a look at this. And in the meantime, it's, I think it has historic possibilities, so I'll go to the city's historic protection group and see if they can put a, a temporary. And, and this squeezed a guy called Saul Friendly, who was trying to hold on to this until the real estate market lifted and it could be torn down and he could make some money out of it into keeping it as a warehouse for uh, heating supplies. And the main theater was where the ovens were? Yeah, yeah well, there was two floors when we right. started here, and the ovens were up above. And if you actually look, there's so much cement that that's where the ovens were. And the main, in the bottom part, 
if you go to the far side, you'll see a door where the carriages could be backed in and loaded. Right. And the, the actual original floor, which I loved and wanted to keep, but nobody else did, had a sloping, wonderful, stony thing like <coughs> Paris streets. Right. And, you know, technicians kept saying, you can't build on this, we've got to have a real theater. Anyhow, I lost that argument. <laughs> and uh, initially, when we had it, we had a flexible space for three different things. Now, the sound divide was not possible so that you could have an upstairs and downstairs going. Right. But I remember when we were doing Modi Anglais and brought, the, brought it back, that we, we tried this experiment, like movies, of having a 7.30 and a, a 9.30 show or something like that, or 7.30 and 9 o'clock show. Didn't work. Uh, Theater-wise, people are set. You just want one. So we then used it as a rehearsal space for one show, uh, performance space for another show. Right. And all the original early hits happened upstairs. Billy Bishop Goes to War, Maggie and Pierre all played up. Right. Upstairs right. in the second right. floor. Yeah. And the irony, of course, was that you could stuff more people by breaking the rules again, uh, particularly for pay what you can is where you kept telling people, no, you can't come in, but if you want to and, and don't want to worry about comfort and sight lines, we might be able to snuff you, stuff you, snuff you in around the corner. We're snuffing back here, I guess, but uh, that's another story. And what about the snuffing back there? Oh, great. I'll come to it in a minute. But <laughs> what was great, I have a memory, and I, I guess I better go back before it gets too uh, high in numbers, <laughs> but I remember actually stuffing over 400 people into a, a pay what you can matinee for Billy Bishop Goes to War and Maggie and Pierre. Wow. And it was like being drunk on that kind of potential, wow. you know. Just, well, you know, with my, what I'm talking about, my fascinating uh, obsession with an audience. Well, I, I fascinated me, anyhow. And uh, it's very, very interesting to watch when people have a hunger to see something and find some kind of connections in there that are important. 